invite you to take your Bible and turn with me to the Revelation, chapter 13, Revelation 13. We'll also be looking in a little bit at Genesis chapter 11, and then a couple other passages of Scripture as well as we go along. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 13, I want to be read verses, to begin with, verses 1 to 7. We'll plan to go back and go through the entire chapter, but first seven verses to begin with. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 13 and verse 1. <clears throat> and I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. <clears throat> Sorry. And upon his heads ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Notice that seventh verse. It was given unto him to make war with the saints and, and to overcome them. And power was given unto him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. We're talking about here a one world dictator. So I want to talk to you this morning on the subject of one world. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you that we can have the freedom to gather together as we are this morning. And Lord, we thank you for other churches around this nation and around the globe who are gathering uh, today to worship you to share your word and to prepare to serve you lord we pray that you would help us this morning we need the help of your holy spirit to be our teacher and our guide to communicate truth to hearts to touch each heart according to need lord it may be that there's one or more people listening today who do not know you as their savior and as that may be the case we pray for their eternal soul salvation that they would trust jesus and be born again and know his forgiveness and the gift of eternal life lord for those who do know you strengthen us prepare our hearts encourage us we pray and bless those who are ill and help us lord to be mindful of the needs of others we ask in jesus name amen now i should have said this when we were making announcements came to my mind while we were praying uh, i'm going to ask you to be praying for the family of Anna Powell, a uh, dear lady who attended our church for years, she went to be with the Lord uh, last week, and the uh, funeral will be this Wednesday at the National Cemetery. And uh, sorry I didn't say that sooner, should have, but uh, at least we've got it there now. The world that we live in is always changing, and yet there are some things that never seem to change. Well, like what, for example? Well, technology changes all the time, seems like every few seconds. But people are about the same as they've always been. Oh, I don't think so, preacher. People don't dress the way they did five years ago. <clears throat> well, I do, but uh, a lot of other people probably don't. But, but the truth of the matter is, uh, you know, a lot of folks change things, but people themselves. How do you know that? Well, just read history. And just read your Bible, and you're going to find that people behave throughout history pretty much the way they do today. The same feelings, same emotions, in many cases the same actions. Uh, well, I don't know. I think we've advanced a lot. Well, we've advanced in some ways, in other ways we haven't. There are always people who want to change the world. And that can be good and that can be bad. And there are some people who do change the world. Some people make major changes. And again, that can be good, it can be bad. Some people change things for good. Some people change things for evil. But things do change. 
Back in the 1980s, I read a book titled Seven Men Who Rule the World from the Grave by Dave Brees. Uh, he was not saying that these seven men uh, rise up out of their grave and, and roam the earth and govern the actions of mankind. He wasn't saying that at all. What he was saying in Seven Men Who Rule the World from the Grave, he was saying that the philosophy of these seven men prevails over the philosophies of those who do rule over the actions of mankind. And the fact of the matter is that these philosophies are prevalent today. Well, who were these seven men that, that Dave Brees wrote about? Well, the first one was Charles Darwin, who popularized the theory of biological evolution as the origin of mankind. Now, I say popularized because he didn't actually originate that theory. Other people had the idea before he did. But he wrote the book called Origin of the Species, and it popularized that idea. And so most of the time today when we talk about people believing in evolution, we'll talk about Darwinist evolution. And yet there's some days, well, I'm an evolutionist, but I'm not a Darwinist. Well, that, that could be true. I wouldn't argue that point with anyone. But there are, uh, generally speaking, people who are influenced heavily by Charles Darwin's theory. And, and understand, it is a theory. There's a difference between a scientific theory and a scientific law. A scientific theory is something that where it's uh, and a hypothesis is formed and a hypothesis is an educated guess and they look at certain things and they say well this is the way we believe things have happened or will happen in certain situations. A law is where the theory or the hypothesis has been tested by experimentation uh, repetitively and proved to work the same way every time. For example, the law of gravity. Uh, gravity is, is, doesn't vary. It's the same all the time. So there's a difference in theory and a difference in law. Say, well, are you a scientist? No, I'm not a scientist, but I've taken a few classes in science and know about what most people would know, I think. So Charles Darwin was number one. Second was Julius Wellhausen, not a name most of you would probably know. Some, some here would. Julius Wellhausen was a German scholar best known for developing a theory that stated in general, and I'm oversimplifying this uh, for sake of time, but his theory dated in general that the Old Testament in particular and the Bible in general is not the inspired word of God, but simply a collection of works of human authors who wanted to create a religion, and uh, we say there are probably 40 authors of the Bible. He thought there were many more, and uh, these various human authors uh, wrote uh, their ideas, their opinions, and their fantasies, and they came up with the Bible. Now, say, why is he influenced the world? Because his writing, and, and by the way, he didn't do this all by himself, and I don't mean to say that, but his writing greatly influenced what's called textual criticism, and that is the idea of looking at the Bible and saying, well, you know, we, I know what you, you read there, I know what you think it says, but that's probably not uh, what was ever meant there and uh, the scriptures themselves in any translation are not reliable even the original manuscripts if we had them uh, are just of human origin and so subject to error and fallibility and so forth so that was Julius Wellhausen John Dewey was a theorist who is recognized as a major influence on American public education he was number three he was a progressive and saw capitalism as a problem. His teachings were taught, thought to be in harmony with anarchists and socialists in the early 20th century, and yet uh, many of his theories, again, are followed today. Number four of the seven men Brees said ruled the world was Soren Kierkegaard, a Danish philosopher who taught existentialism. That is that personal experience and choice are the guides of life. That's kind of where, and I'm not saying Kierkegaard said this himself, but that's kind of where people get this idea of what's true for you may not be true for me. What's reality for you may not be reality for me. It's all based on personal experience. Now, he did say that people may know God through a leap of faith, but not through any doctrine. Number five on that list was Sigmund Freud, 
a medical doctor who developed psychoanalysis and uh, the whole field of psychiatry was influenced by Sigmund Freud. Now there is a difference between a psychiatrist and a psychologist, uh, two very different things. Freud was the uh, pretty much the father of modern psychiatry. Number six on the list, John Maynard Keynes, an English economist whose theories changed the economic policies of major governments and many follow his teaching to today. Number seven, the last one, Karl Marx, an economist and philosopher whose theoretical writings have been used as the basis for communism. And uh, his influence is certainly in the world today. Now, why do you bring that up? Why do you bring that, that book up and these seven men in that book? Because there are always those who want to change the world. And as we said before, some want to change it for good. Some want to change it for evil. Uh, many want to change things so that they themselves will benefit from their new order. What do you mean by that? I mean that Paul writes and says the love of money is the root of all evil. He didn't say money is the root of all evil. Never, said, never does the Bible say it's evil to have money. Some people think that. Well, if you've got money, you must be evil. That's, that's a fallacy. But the truth of the matter is the love of money or greed, selfishness, that's what he's saying is the root of all evil. And then there is the greed, the lust for power. John writes, and he says, all that is in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Uh, the idea of having power, having control over other people, having control over other things, uh, but particularly having control over other people. So all of these philosophers and their philosophies are opposed to the teachings of the Bible. In fact, most of them, if not all of them, reject the Bible as being a message from God and view it as a collection of fiction and some will go so far as to say fairy tales. No better, and perhaps not even equivalent to Greek and Roman mythology. So why would all these writers oppose the Bible and Jesus Christ? What do they see, what's the benefit of doing that? Well, the answer is that many of them see Jesus Christ and the Bible as the only thing standing in the way of what they want. You get rid of the Bible, get rid of Jesus, you get rid of God, and then we can do what we want. The Bible tells us of all these truths and others that we need to proclaim, uh, but I want us to go back and go through the scriptures and look at kind of a history of where all this started because it's not something that began in the 20th century. So I'm going to ask you to hold your place here in Revelation 13. We are coming back to it. But turn with me all the way back, if you will, to the book of Genesis and Genesis chapter 11. Now, many parts of the Bible have been criticized through the years, but probably some of the most criticized chapters of the Bible are the first 11 chapters of Genesis get to chapter 12 and it begins the story of Abraham and, and his descendants and many people will give a little more credibility to that but the first 11 chapters they like to say are either pure fantasy or perhaps they're allegorical uh, but they're certainly not supposed to be literal I submit to you and this is not my opinion alone but I submit to you that if the first 11 chapters of Genesis aren't literal then we really don't have much foundation at all for the rest of the Bible. How, how do you know if those chapters aren't true, how do you know what chapters are true? How would you discern? What lines would you draw? Well, we mentioned Wellhausen earlier, the graph wellhausen theory. They, they had their lines that they drew. Uh, I mentioned those here before, but I tell you those lines would be confusing to you at best. So in Genesis chapter 2, we find the creation of man. <clears throat> in chapter 3, we're told of the rebellion and fall of the first man, which brought sin into the world. Romans 5, 12, Paul writes, Wherefore, as by one man sin uh, came into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So we inherit the sin nature from uh, 
our great-great-granddaddy Adam. And that, by the way, is one of the main things that necessitated the virgin birth of Jesus Christ so that he would not inherit the sin nature of Adam. But in Genesis chapter 11... Verses 1 to 9, we're told of the division of humanity into various people groups which became the nations of the world. Now, if you go back to chapter 10, there's a history given of the different families of earth. And somebody says, well, how did that happen? And then you have the events of chapter 11. It's not all chronological there. As a matter of fact, the events of chapter 11 are referenced in chapter 10. But in chapter 10, 11 verse 1 it says and the whole earth was of one language and of one speech now that's an important statement everybody on the planet spoke the same language and listen to me carefully if you study world religions you're going to find there are vast differences in them but there are certain commonalities and if you study anthropology, you'll find there are other certain commonalities, all of which lend support to the fact that everybody at one time knew the truth. There was a time when everybody on the planet knew about God. I am not saying they were all born again. I'm not saying they all trusted God as their savior. I'm saying they all knew about the existence of God. Well, give me an example of that. All right, probably the two oldest continual civilizations. There were older civilizations than these two I'm about to mention. But I'm talking about ones that have continued through the millennia and are here today as Egypt and China. They have some of the oldest civilizations on the planet, continual civilizations. If you look into Chinese history, you will find that the Chinese people were originally monotheist. They believed in one God. They called their gods Shang-Ti, the, which means the heavenly emperor. And if you look into how they worship that one God, you're going to find some very striking similarities to the way Abraham worshiped in the Bible. Now, how is that possible? Well, it's very possible if they all came from a common origin, isn't it? So what are you saying? I'm saying, again, there was a time when everybody on the planet knew about God knew there was a God and had some revelation of God. Now, again, I'm not saying there was a time when everybody was godly. That's, that's a different matter. But here in chapter 11, verse 1, says the whole earth was of one language and one speech. Now, what language was that? Folks, I don't know. Sumerian, I suppose. But I don't know that. Well, why do you think Sumerian? Because it's the oldest language that people have discovered so far. That's why I think that. But was that the one language? I don't know. But here's what we do know. One language for all people. Today, there are more than 140 different language groups on the planet, giving us more than 7,000 different languages and dialects throughout the whole world. But in those days, there was only one. The top 10 major languages spoken in the world today are English, approximately, these are approximate numbers, but 1.13 uh, billion people on the planet speak English. 1.12 billion, very close behind that, uh, speak Mandarin. So it's the second most spoken language in the world. 615 million people speak Hindi. 534 million people speak Spanish as their primary language. 274 million people speak Arabic. 268 Bengali. 267 French. 258 Russian and Portuguese. 258 each. Uh, and 230 people, million people on the earth speak Urdu, the official language of Pakistan. Those are the top 10 major languages. But as I said, there are 7,000, more than 7,000 languages on the planet today. Now, I admire people who are multilingual. I, I had a teacher years ago who spoke seven languages fluently. I was very impressed with that. I still am very impressed with that. 
uh, I, I do well to do one language. But the, the truth of the matter is I, I, I respect folks who are multilingual, but I've never come across anybody who spoke 7,000 plus languages. So there's a massive work to be done to get the gospel into all of these different language groups and, and variations. But verse 2, in Genesis 11, verse 2, it came to pass as they journeyed from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. So everybody settled in one area of the world. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime they had for mortar. Now there's something to that, but we're not going to spend time on it this morning. So what happened to this? They began in verse 4 to build a tower. And they said, go to, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name that we, lest we be scattered upon the face of the whole earth. Now, when I was a boy and I'd gone to Sunday school some and I heard about this, I thought they were building a tower so tall they could climb into heaven. And so go up the stairs like Jack and the Beanstalk, you know, and, and go all the way up into heaven. That's not what this is saying. It's not what it's saying. They did build a tower. Uh, it's, it's possible that remnants of that tower still exist. It's, if not that one, similar ones are found in that area. They call them ziggurats. But the, the fact of the matter is they bear a striking similarity to the uh, pyramids that you will find in South America and Central America. Now, how did that happen? How did people in the Middle East build something and people in South Central America build almost the same thing? And we could, we could spend a lot of time talking on that. I, uh, I noticed some years ago when we were uh, out in the Navajo Nation and we were visiting some ancient ruins out there that there were uh, arch-shaped niches carved into the walls of the dwellings there that were identical to the ones I had seen in the Middle East in some of the ancient ruins there. There's more and more to that. What are you saying? I'm saying everybody started out in one part of the world and spread out to the rest of the world. That's what I'm saying. And there's so much evidence of that. But what we're seeing here in verse 4 was a one-world, man-made religion. They said a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. Now again, not that it would be so tall as to be able to climb into heaven, but a religion that would take people to heaven. And most likely at the top of that tower was a temple, a place of worship. But what it was, was a state religion. The government and the religion were bonded together as one entity. So this in Genesis 11 is the beginning of a state religion. Now, I'm going to share a descriptive word with you, and I'm, I'm going to give you a lot of uh, explanation before I say the word, because you know the word, you're familiar with it, but I want to tell you why I'm applying it to this particular situation. It is an English word. Uh, it's not of English origin, but it has become an English word. And I, in using this word, I'm not out to get anybody or hurt anyone. I'm simply trying to help you understand what Genesis 11 is talking about. In all likelihood, this word was not used in the days of the Tower of Babel, uh, which was located in Mesopotamia in the area that would come to be called Babylon in what we presently would call Iraq. But this descriptive English word, according to Merriam-Webster, means comprehensive, universal, broad on sympathies, taste, and interest. Okay, you with me? A word that means comprehensive, universal, broad on sympathies, taste, and interest. So an all-encompassing term for this religion. What is the word? Catholic. That's what that word means. It means, again, comprehensive, universal, broad on sympathies, taste, and interest. So they said, let us make us a name. Mankind wanted to exalt themselves. Many people believe to this day if they could just become famous, they would find great happiness. 
Can I share something with you? There is so much evidence that fame by itself does not bring happiness. I've read so many stories from people who were famous whose names, if I mentioned them, you'd say, yeah, I, I sure know who that is or who they were. Uh, and how it was did not bring them happiness. I read about one fellow, again, if I mentioned his name, most everybody here would say, yeah, yeah, I, I remember who that was, who became world famous. I, I don't think that's debatable. This one was world famous, and yet he said that it became such a pressure upon him that he just wanted to get away from it, just wanted to escape it, leave it all behind. It did not bring happiness. And yet, people strive for fame. They strive for popularity. And they were saying, we don't want to be scattered abroad upon the face of the earth. Now, God told Noah and his sons, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And the idea was that the descendants of Noah were supposed to populate the planet, not just one simple portion of it. They were literally to go into all the world. Now that not only meant uh, what we call the Middle East, but that meant all of Europe and Africa and Asia and North and South America and, and all of it. But what about Antarctica? Yeah, you know that people don't think so. There are people who live there. You, you did know that, right? There are. Yeah, people that nobody lives there. Yes, they do. But look at verse 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Now you would think the things the Lord says here in verse 6, those are good things. The people's all one. We have unity. And they all have one language. We have communication. And nothing be restrained from them what they have imagined to do. We can have all kinds of development. Well, those should be good things. Those should be welcome characteristics. The problem with is that mankind tends to take these things and corrupt them. So in verse 7, God says, go to, let us go down. Interesting, he says, let us go down. We don't have time to develop that, but pay attention to it. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. Now, pay close attention to that. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, <clears throat> and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, or Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and <clears throat> from the, thence... Did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of the earth? So the people were scattered out, their languages divided, and they couldn't understand each other. And I've heard people talk about how that must have been. They're trying to build this tower. And one guy says, the other says, <clears throat> hand me a hammer, will you? And the other says, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, what are you saying? They, they just didn't understand each other at all. And so they divided into people groups. God scattered the people through the world, which was his will in the first place, that they would establish families and nations and countries. So what was wrong with what the people were doing in Genesis 11? Well, it was rebellion against the known and revealed will of God. Again, they knew about God. They knew what God's will, what his plan and purpose was. They rebelled against it. Now, I'm not going to ask you to turn there, but I'm going to read to you from Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 to 14, where it says this, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Uh, that's a significant phrase. I will sit in the mount of the congregation the sides of the north. Uh, Psalm 48, 1 and 2 said, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for situation, 
the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion in the sides of the north, the city of the great king. What did Lucifer say? He said, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. What is Lucifer saying there? I will sit on the throne of God. I will be the king of the universe. I will be the God of this universe. He went on to say, I will ascend above the height of the clouds. I will be like the most high. High. It was the goal of Satan to rule the universe. In order to do that, God would have to be removed. Satan failed to accomplish that goal. How do you know? I read Revelation chapter 12. If you read Revelation chapter 12, you'll know the same thing. But like most people, Lucifer or Satan had a backup plan. All right, can't rule the whole universe. How about I rule the human race? That'll work. I can do that. And so his next goal was to reign over mankind. Now Daniel was given prophecies of the end times. And I tell you, there are folks who want to totally reject Daniel because Daniel is so precise in his prophecies. Gave us a prophecy down to the year of when the Messiah would come. Didn't tell us the exact day, but told us the year when the Messiah would come. And other prophecies in Daniel are that precise. Daniel was told of a personage who was going to appear, is going to appear upon the earth, Daniel 7, 25, and he shall speak great words against the Most High. What did I just read to you from Isaiah 14? Great words against the Most High. And shall wear out the saints of the Most High. If you remember we read that in Revelation 13, he'll make war against the saints. Wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time, times, and a dividing of time. Again, a very significant phrase we don't have time to develop. That's Daniel 7.25. In Daniel 9.26 he speaks of the prince that shall come. Now that is not a reference. The prince that shall come is not a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ and his, his coming. It is this. In Ephesians 2.2, 2, Paul writes, Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, you lived your life according to this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Who's the prince of the power of the air? Well, this guy with a... International radio broadcast, right? Prince of power. No, that's not it. That's not it. The prince of the power of the air. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Same writer, Paul, 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. He said, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. In whom the God, little g, of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Who's he saying? The prince of the power of the air, the God of this world, the prince, Daniel said, that shall come. This is a satanic situation. Now I'm going to ask you to take your Bible and turn with me to leave Genesis, turn with me over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're not going to spend a lot of time there, just a little bit, but I, I want to think better that you look at it. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3. The end of verse 2, Paul says that the day of Christ is at hand, or let nobody deceive you about that. So verse 3, he says, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, the day of Christ, shall not come except there come a falling away first. Now that's a very important phrase, a falling away first. Many people read that and they believe that is a great apostasy, a falling away from the faith, a turning away from the faith, a great apostasy. And I certainly see where people would read it that way. But the concept of falling away also can be rendered as catching away. And this is, without trying to do any violence to scripture, let's just read it that way for a second. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come 
except there had come a catching away first. Now, why would you even think it's that? Because falling away sounds like it's, it's the apostasy, and, and I'm not, again, I'm not discrediting people who, who interpret it that way because I see how they get it. But if you were to go back to chapter 4 of the previous book, and, and this won't be on your screen, but chapter 4, beginning at verse 14, it says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be, listen, caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Caught up. Caught out of this world. Caught out of this world. Revelation 4, 1, John sees a vision of heaven and he hears a voice saying, come up hither. And next thing he knows, he's in heaven. The idea of being caught up, caught away, uh, there's a Latin word for that. It's raptura, from which we get our English word rapture. So when you hear people talking about the rapture, this is what they're talking about, this catching away. Now let's go back and look at 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2 and verse 3 again. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So we have different names here, the prince that shall come, the prince of the power of the air, the god of this world, and now the son of perdition, all referring to the same individual. But that day shall not come unless there's a falling away first, or either a great apostasy, as many think, but as I see it, a catching away, as described by the same writer writing to the same audience, the church at Thessalonica, as he described in his previous epistle, chapter 4. Who is this son of perdition? Well, verse 4, he is the one who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. He comes and claims to be God. What did Lucifer say? I will be like the Most High. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation side of the north. I will ascend above the height of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. I'm going to sit in God's place. What does it say here? He opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, that as he, that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, claiming to be God. Worship me. Forget about this God that you've read about in the Bible. Forget about Jesus Christ. For worship me. Verse 5, Paul says, Remember ye not that when I was with you, yet with you, I told you these things? And now you know what withholdeth, what holds back, that he might be revealed in his time. Who's going to be revealed in his time? This man of sin, the son of perdition. Verse 7, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. This, this is process of all this is already happening, has been happening for thousands of years. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth, and the word let there, we say let and we think to allow something. Unless you're in England, that means to rent something. But, but the fact of the matter is, what it means here is not to let, but to hold back. Same idea where it says what withholdeth. So he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Somebody is holding back evil until that somebody is taken out of the way. Who is that somebody? That's the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. Now, where is the Holy Spirit of God? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwelleth in you, talking to believers. The Spirit of God is in people. Let me share this with you. Where you find a greater number of Christians, you will find a lesser amount of evil. Where you find a lesser amount of Christians, you will find a greater amount of evil. Now, why is that? 
because Christians are indwelt with the Holy Spirit. So where you have a greater number of Christians, you have a larger presence of the Holy Spirit. Where you have a lesser number of Christians, you have a lesser presence of the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense to you? Okay. So what is he saying here? He's saying the Holy Spirit will be taken out of the way. How, when does that happen? Paul told it to us. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air. This is that catching away or rapture that he talked about. 1 Corinthians 15, same writer Paul says, in a moment, in twinkling of an eye. And that phrase twinkling of an eye means speed of light. How fast is that? 186,000 miles per second. That's fast, folks. So, what is it saying? Verse 8. 2 Thessalonians 2, 8. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Very important statements here. Number one, then shall that wicked be revealed. When? After the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way. When is the Holy Spirit taken out of the way? When the, those in whom the Holy Spirit dwell are taken out of this world. Then the prince that shall come shall be revealed. A lot of people throughout history have been trying to figure out who this is, and they pointed to different people, and, and there have been many who seem like good candidates. Uh, many people thought Benito Mussolini was, was the Antichrist. Obviously he was not. Dave Hunt, and I've mentioned this before, wrote a book and he, in, in one of his chapters of his book, Peace, Prosperity, the Coming Holocaust, he has a chapter titled Hitler, the Almost Antichrist. And he's saying Hitler was not the Antichrist, but he's a good example of what the Antichrist would be like when he comes. But Hitler was not the Antichrist. Let's, let's fast forward into more recent times. In the 1970s, Henry Kissinger was the Secretary of, S Secretary of State, and people said he is the Antichrist because if you take the numerical uh, value of the, each letter of his name, it adds up to 666. Henry Kissinger was not the Antichrist. A little bit later, in the 80s, Mikhail Gorbachev was the Prime Minister of Russia of the Soviet Union, and they said he is the Antichrist because he has a mark on his head. Well, he did have a mark on his head, but he obviously was not the Antichrist. You want, a, you want another one from that same era? People said Ronald Wilson Reagan. You take the numerical value of Ronald Wilson Na Reagan, and it adds up to 666. Therefore, he was the Antichrist. Which one of those was the Antichrist? None of them. Well, the Caesars were the Antichrist. Well, they're gone, aren't they? Well, the Pope is the Antichrist. Well, not yet. <laughs> See, what are, what are you bringing all this up for? This passage right here tells you you're wasting your time trying to figure out who the Antichrist is. There are several people walking the planet right now that I think are good candidates, but I can't tell you that one of them is the Antichrist. Are you with me? Okay. Now, it tells you you're not going to know who this is. That wicked won't be revealed until the Holy Spirit's taken out of the way. Then you'll know who that is. And you know what? I'm not going to be here to worry about it. Amen. And I trust you won't be either. Verse 8 again. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. You read that in Revelation chapter 19 and with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, with all deceivableness and unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. People who reject God. So, to review what we just read, that day, the, the day of the Antichrist will not come, except there's a falling away first. Then the man of sin appears. He exalts himself above all that is called God, just as Lucifer said in Isaiah 14. But he's withheld by the Holy Spirit. Now, when that 
prince that shall come arrives. He's here for a short time, and then the Lord consumes him, and his coming is after the working of Satan. He does miracles. All that is backdrop. Go back to Revelation 13, and very quickly, we're going to work through that chapter. Revelation chapter 13. It's divided into two sections, verses 1 to 10 and verses 11 to 18. There are two beasts, one mentioned in verses 1 to 10, a second beast mentioned in verses 11 to 18. One is a great world political leader. The other is a great world religious leader. Very quickly, let's go through and take a look at those, and we'll be finished this morning. In verses 1 and 2, and I, John says, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Now, again, if we were to go back to Daniel 7 and 9, this heads and horns and all that will make a lot more sense to you. Verse 2, and the beast which I saw was like a leopard. This, again, uh, back to Daniel 7 and 9. The beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. If we were to look at the previous chapter, Revelation 12, you'd see that Satan there is called a great red dragon. So the dragon it's talking about who gives him these things are is, is Satan himself. Now, notice what he gives him. The dragon gave him his power. He has satanic power, a seat or a throne, and great authority. Something else we learned about this individual. Verse 3, and I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. So there is, this one is wounded to death, and yet recovers. What do you have there? A simulated resurrection. He appears to have been killed and then come back. Who else do we know of who was killed and came back? Oh, that would be Jesus Christ. The word antichrist, and I've used it several times already, means one who is in the place of or one who opposes. One who opposes Christ or replaced Christ. And that's the idea here. Forget about Jesus Christ. I am your Messiah. I am your Savior. That's what he's saying. Look, I came back from the dead. Now, why do you say it's a simulated resurrection? Because I don't think it's genuine. Why don't you think so? Because all through 2 Thessalonians 2 and through this passage, we find that he has deceit and lying wonders. Why wouldn't that be one of them? But the result is as he would desire, verse 4, and they worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast who is able to make war with him? Nobody like him. You kill him, he comes back. How are you going to make war with that? Might as well just surrender. Can't beat that. And so... They worship the beast himself and the dragon, satanic worship. So we come then to verse 5. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things. This again referenced in Daniel. There was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue 40 and 2 months. Another significant statement that we don't have time to develop. But there's a definite time frame. Verse 6, and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God. To blaspheme his name. Uh, God holds his name. He says, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless to take his name in vain. But he blasphemes the name of God and his tabernacle the temple, and them that dwell in heaven. Verse 7, it was given unto him, and this is where we were in the beginning, to make war with the saints. What is he doing? Declaring war on the saints of God. 
Oh, wait a minute, preacher. You said he comes after the rapture. That's right. Well, how are there saints of God? There will be people saved during what we call the tribulation period. The Bible is very clear about that. It was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. He wins that war. And power was given him, watch this, such a significant statement, over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. What does that mean? Everybody. All kindreds, all families of the earth, all tongues, 7,000 plus languages, and nations, all countries. A ruler who rules the whole world. Many people have tried to rule the world over the years. Genghis Khan ruled a great portion of it. A lot larger than, a lot of Americans don't read up about Genghis Khan. You should. He controlled all of what we call Asia now, and, and then even Eastern Europe. Started out in Mongolia, came all the way across, conquered it all. That's a huge section of the planet. What did he want? He wanted the rest of the planet. He just didn't get it all. Others have tried to do that. The Babylonian Empire wanted to conquer the world. They didn't make it. The Persian Empire got bigger, but they didn't conquer. The Greeks got bigger than the Persians. They didn't conquer it all. The Roman Empire got hold of all the world that they were interested in. The rest of it, they didn't care about. Do you think they knew about the rest of the world? I do. <laughs> they just didn't care about it. They didn't see any profit in it. And others have tried to do that. Adolf Hitler reached out and took all of Europe and descended down into Africa. He wanted it all. He didn't get it all. We could go on and on with that people today want a one world government. Now some people do that out of sheer greed and lust for power as we said before. Some people do it because they think it's a great idea. Oh, you get everybody together under one government, that'll be the end of war, we'll finally have world peace, and everything will be peace and harmony worldwide. It won't work. Well, you're such a pessimist. Why do you think it won't work? Name me a government under which, anywhere, any government anywhere, under which there's total peace and harmony with everybody. You can't name one. I could give you many illustrations of that, but you can't name one. So if we have one world government, first of all, it's not going to bring universal peace and harmony. Secondly, you got to stop and ask yourself, what government is that going to be? Right. I'll tell you what it's not going to be. It's not going to be the government of the United States, that's for sure. What government is it going to be? It tells us right here in this passage what it's going to be. Look at verse 7 again. And it was given to him to make war with saints, to overcome them, and power given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Where did he get his power? Back to verse 2. The dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. What government is this going to be? A satanic government. There's no question about it. It tells you that very clearly right here. Verse 9, if any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. Verse 11, second beast. I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake like a dragon. Very interesting wording there. Two horns like a lamb, but he speaks like a dragon. What does this say? He has the appearance of Christ. He looks like Christ, but he talks like the devil. Verse 12, and he exercises, watch this, all the power of the first beast before him. Where did the first beast get his power? From the dragon. Who is the dragon? Lucifer or Satan. So where does this one get his power? Lucifer or Satan. He exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So what does he do? Leads the world to worship the first beast. And back in verse 4, what do we find? They worship the dragon and the beast. So ultimately, who are they worshiping? Satan. 
Verse 13, and he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth inside of men. Well, why would he do that? That's what Elijah did. And, verse 14, deceiveth them that dwelleth on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image of the beast and that had the wound by a sword and did live. First of all, he's going to create an idol, an image. And this image is of the first beast, the world political leader, and he's to be worshipped. And remember, he died and rose again. So why wouldn't we worship him? Verse 15. And he had power to give unto the image of the beast, give life, uh, sorry, unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So this image of the beast speaks and has authority. Now how does that happen? I don't know. Is it supernatural or is it technological? I don't know. Could be either one. But today's technology is very believable. You have all kinds of virtual reality. This was uh, 2019, I think, might have been 2020, but I think it was 2019, that uh, Saudi Arabia granted citizenship. Now, you don't have to take my word for this. You can look it up. Granted citizenship to a robot. And this robot looks like a woman and speaks like a woman. It's not a woman. It's a machine. Is that the kind of thing we're talking about here? I don't know. I don't know, folks. All I'm telling you is the technology is there for something like that. It happens, has been for a long time. That's not new. Maybe it's technological. Maybe it's supernatural. But this image of the beast speaks, and they worship this idol. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, God says. God forbids throughout the Old Testament the worship of idolatry. Because behind every idol is a demonic spirit. And this is certainly no exception. Verse 16, and he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. That technology is here today, too. Uh, people have debated for millennia now what this mark is and how it works, and I don't have all the answers to that. Now, you can go on the Internet and you can find all kinds of people who say they do have the answer. Maybe they do. I'm not convinced that all of them are right because they don't all say the same thing. But here's what we do know. There will be such a mark. Back in the 70s and 80s, they said, well, it's, it's one of those barcodes you know, that you see on all the products. Everybody's going to have a barcode on it. Now they say, no, it's more likely a chip that's implanted. Well, could be. Could be. And now people are saying it'll be injected. Will it? I don't know. There will be a mark, and without that mark, you're not going to be able to buy or sell. You're not going to be able to do business. How are you going to live? How are you going to eat? But you don't have a problem if you just take the mark. Well, there's a problem with that, and that is that later in the Revelation, it tells us that all who receive the mark are lost, condemned for all eternity. Verse 18, here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is six hundred, three score, and six. So why is it six, six, six? Six is the number of man. Man was created on the sixth day. Why three sixes? It, we have the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. What we have here is an unholy Trinity. You have the dragon, the beast, the world political leader, and the second beast, the world religious leader. The counter to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The unholy spirit, uh, the dragon, the prince that shall come, the first beast, and the world religious leader corresponding to the Holy Spirit. Now they're not, they're counterfeit, they're not the Trinity, but they form a Trinity. And so you have man, humanism, in control 
over all the earth. And finally, human beings say, we got rid of God. There's so much more here. What is this one world religion? I heard a very scholarly man who I respect very much. I was listening to him when I was preparing for this. And he said, well, he thinks it's this. The largest religion on the planet is Christianity. Now, you've got to paint that with a broad brush because that means everybody who calls themselves a Christian, and they don't all believe the same thing. I trust you know that. Some believe in salvation by grace through faith. Many believe in salvation by works. Uh, various, various, various. But everybody who calls themselves Christian comprise the largest religion on earth. Second largest religion on earth is Islam and growing. So this very scholarly man who I respect very much said he thinks that uh, the Christians, nominal Christians, and Islam will band together to become, to, to fight atheism because they're both against atheism. And in the Middle East, a common statement is that the enemy of my friend is, uh, enemy of my enemy is my friend. So it's not unreasonable that they would team together and fight against atheism both against atheism. Then this very scholarly man said that he feels that um, once that's done, once atheism is defeated, then Islam would conquer the Christianity and uh, Islam would be the one world religion. Is that true? I don't know. I, I, I don't think that's what it is. Why don't you think so? Because it's flat out told here in verse 13 that it's the worship of the dragon and of the beast the worship of Satan. Now, that's not, Islam does not profess to worship Satan. They, well, and they're, they're false god and all that, but they don't profess to worship Satan. So what do you have here? What I think you have is a weird blend of the world's religions all aimed at worshiping the dragon and the beast. That's what I think you have. So what's the conclusion? Well, these are things that we read about that will happen. They haven't happened yet. Say, so, well, it sure looks to me like they're in process. Yeah, it looks to many of us like that. But how close is it? Folks, I do not know. Let me remind you, it's looked that way before. Paul expected these things to happen in his lifetime. John expected these things to happen in his lifetime. So when does it happen? I don't know. It sure looks like we're getting close. But I've told you all the bad news. Let me tell you the good news. The good news is we're not looking for the Antichrist. We're looking for Jesus Christ. Okay. We're looking for the, not for the counterfeit, but for the real Savior. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Then he said, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, four important words, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whether you go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest. How can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. What's the solution to all this? Put your faith in the Lord Jesus. That's the solution to all of it. Trust Him. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you for this time we've had together. Lord, so much in our world seems to be building towards the things that we've read about today. And yet, Lord, our focus needs to be upon you. You have promised to come. You've promised to receive us unto yourself. You've shown us, Lord, that you will come before the worst happens here. And you've told us, Lord, to be waiting and to be watching and to be ready. Lord, help us to do those things to be waiting, to be watching, to be ready. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. First thing you need to do in order to be ready is to know that you're saved. 
You need to know and understand that Jesus loves you, that he paid for your sins at the cross, and that all he asks you to do is believe in him, trust him. He'll forgive your sins, he'll save your soul, he'll give you everlasting life. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Call on him, trust him. With the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Call and pray and say, Lord Jesus, I do believe. I believe that you love me. I believe that you're the son of God. I believe that you paid for my sins at the cross. And right here, right now, I'm trusting you to forgive my sins, to save my soul, to give me everlasting life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Maybe you prayed that prayer, maybe you didn't. Maybe you say, well, it sounds good to me, preacher. I'm not sure I understand it. We'd be glad to help you with that. In any case, you can call upon the Lord right where you are whether you're here in the room or whether you're listening electronically, wherever you are, you can call upon him and be saved. I trust that you will. But I assume that most people listening today have already trusted the Lord as their Savior. So what can you be doing to get ready? You can be watching for the Lord to come. You can be helping other people to be saved so that they're ready for the Lord to come. You can stand for the truth. You can spread the truth. You can live a godly example so that other people will see your life and want to know who it is that makes you the person you are, and they will want to be saved also. This is watching and waiting and being ready. Don't be discouraged. Be encouraged. Jesus is coming. God spoke into your heart today. There's a spiritual need in your life. We can help you with salvation. We can help you with another need. We're going to sing a hymn. You come while we sing and respond this morning. Lord, bless and move this invitation time. We do pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's